You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London, and I'm Daniel Sinner with a discussion on the future of rail franchising in Britain. The way we manage our railways in Britain is fatally flawed. That's according to one of the architects of the privatisation system. In Britain, the train lines are franchised and sold off to private companies to run for a fixed amount of time. But last week, the decision to award the West Coast Main Line to the company First Group was scrapped by the government. The company had beaten current operator Virgin Trains, owned by Richard Branson, to win the 13-year franchise. But the British Transport Secretary, Patrick McLaughlin, said there were significant technical flaws in the bidding process because of mistakes by his staff at the Department of Transport. The estimated cost of reimbursing four companies for the cost of their bids will be £40 million. Now Chris Stokes, the former Deputy Director of Franchising at the Department of Transport, says the system is convoluted complicated and inefficient. Nearly 20 years ago, his department sold all 25 franchises, with each bid costing between £250 and £500,000, a process that took just six months. Now the cost is over £5 million, and the whole process takes around a year. So, what is the future of rail franchising? Joining me is Christian Walmar, one of Britain's leading transport commentators. Neil Clark is a journalist and founder of the Campaign for Public Ownership. And John Page is the Assistant General Secretary of the TSSA Union, which represents people working in transport and travel. So I'll begin with you, Christian okay. Walmar, one of Britain's leading transport commentators. Um, is the system broken? Uh, well, I think it is. I mean, we have a unique system in the UK of having franchised out our whole railway to private companies on the basis that they take the revenue risk. In other words, they collect all the fares income, but that means they have to then guess uh, how much fares income they expect to get over the length of the fr franchise, which uh, have ranged in the past from just uh, three or five years, uh, and now they're trying to let longer franchises, 13 years in the case of the West Coast Main Line. Um, and uh, over the years, various uh, franchise bidders have failed, uh, notably on the East Coast, happened a couple of times. Uh, but also, one has to wonder, what, why are you passing this risk on to the private sector when nobody knows how many people are going to run the train, or use the trains in uh, three years' time, let alone in 10 or 15 years' time? So it is inevitable that this sort of contract, this weird system, which we call franchising, which is more used to KFC or McDonald's or something, uh, why this weird system of franchising has been uh, used by both the Tories and um, the Labour government and now the coalition government. And Neil Clark from the Campaign for Public Ownership. Hello there. I think the system is absolutely crazy. We, we've got a system whereby uh, the state is subsidising private companies. Uh, we're putting in about five times more than we did when we had British Rail, when it was state-owned. It would be much cheaper to bring this back in-house and scrap the entire complicated system. We have the, the highest rail fares in Europe, if not the world. Uh, season tickets are up to ten times more expensive here than they are in U European countries. Uh, day returns are up to three times more expensive. And we've got a real sort of uh, financial scam going on here because what's happened is the taxpayer is being hit twice. Double whammy situation, really, because we're paying the highest train fares, as I've said, when we buy our tickets, but we're also paying more in our taxes than we did when it was state-owned. So the system is absolutely crazy. It benefits no one except the fat cats, except the private companies and their shareholders. The, the, the passengers are being ripped off. So it's got to end, I think. And John Page from the TSSA Union. Well, I, I think the system is broken. I don't even know what the system is meant to achieve. Of course... Uh, the Conservative government, when they undertook privatisation, said it would lead to greater efficiencies. Um, and yet we see across the whole of Europe, we have European nationalised rail companies bidding to run British franchises and often succeeding. And then any profits they make go off to subsidise uh, passengers throughout Europe. So we have a, a, a franchise system which is, leads to a completely fragmented rail system, uh, a billion pound of money going out of the system, uh, for no obvious reason. Um, and we have 
financial co- uh, these rail operating companies whose only interest is in profit, nothing to do with the quality of service or the number of passengers uh, or, or the experience of passengers when they get on the trains. So it's, it's a, a real mess. Neil Clark, um, mm. when this franchise system was first set up about 20 years ago, each bid cost about 250 to 500,000 pounds. Now it costs 5 million. 5 million, yeah, absolutely. What on earth went wrong? Well, it's all, it's all the fees, isn't it? The payoffs, the consultants' fees, etc. It's just become incredibly expensive. And, and you know, this latest fiasco is going to cost us 40 million pounds. And there's going to be probably legal challenges from First Great Western as well to add into it, all the costs of that. So it's absolutely balmy. The taxpayer's being ripped off in a massive way. I think the problem here is what, what's, what's happened is it started off, as you suggest, as a relatively simple idea. OK, you have a, a bunch of routes and you say, OK, to the private company, uh, run them and we'll set out a relatively simple contract. And then they found out that, oh, if they do that, then and they, the government gets it wrong slightly, uh, companies start making a lot of profits. So they think, well, we don't really want that. And then they realised also that actually if there's a recession, then the companies will go bust and we don't really want that. So then they overlaid a system called cap and collar that protects it. And uh, then they found out, well, actually, uh, if the economy booms, then they might make super profits and we want to rein those. So in that process, you get a whole addition of complexity every time. And that's what's gone wrong in this case, that it's got so complicated that uh, nobody quite understands the bids and and, and the whole process. From what we've heard so far from all three of you, the franchise system sounds like a total failure. But can we really label the franchise system for the last two decades as a failure? The, the system is a failure. The franchising system is a failure. The railways aren't. Uh, the railways have been uh, growing at an absolute uh, enormous rate, um, but that's due to external factors. It's due to the fact that the roads are more congested. People, you know, there was a, a long boom in in the labour years. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, people like trains. There has been considerable investment, and so on. But nothing of that is to do with the franchising system and the way it's structured. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London, and I'm Daniel Sinner. Joining me for a discussion on the future of rail franchising is Christian Walmar, one of Britain's leading transport commentators. Neil Clark is a journalist and founder of the Campaign for Public Ownership. And John Page is the Assistant General Secretary of the TSSA Union, which represents people working in transport and travel. John Page, would you agree with that? What we've got is a situation where, the, what is the purpose of the franchising system? What is it aiming to achieve? And it's not clear to me, but what we have seen, and it's not, this, this is not the only example where, where there's been collapse, I remember what's now London Overground, which was run by Silverlink, and their strategy was to take as many staff out of the system as possible and what we had was a system where most people were afraid to go down and use that rail service in the evenings because they were unmanned, unstaffed. And uh, those people who did, it was, it was up to you whether you paid because there was no one there to check your ticket. Now, when that came back into the TfL family, there was massive investment in staff, in rolling stock and in, in making the stations uh, a, a, a place where people felt safe. As a consequence of that, there was no cost because the revenue increase that came back in more than paid for those improvements. And I think that's the problem with the franchise. It's about squeezing maximum profit rather than delivering a, a service that, that passengers need. Neil Clark from the Campaign for Public Ownership. The government seemed to think that the railways need to be privatised even more. Yeah, it, they're, <laughs> they're talking about extending the it, contracts. It's totally crazy, isn't it? They want longer contracts. It, it, beyond belief, really. I mean, I don't think we can get the franchise system to work better. It's fundamentally flawed. And, and, and as John said, the basic problem is privatisation. The fact is, is that private companies are always going to be interested in one thing, profit maximisation. Railways in this country should be run as a public service, as they are you know, in Germany, in France, in Switzerland, all over Europe. And, you know, we've got to, to get back to that. But surely having these longer term contracts, companies will say this gives them the stability they need for investment. But they're not investing. I mean, the investment rates have been appalling. The only real investments that have gone on on the railways in the last 20 years have been from the state. The, the state investment. Private companies is just going out to shareholders. Let's be clear. John. The reason why this government wants long franchises is it wants to frustrate the democratic will of the people. It is absolutely clear people want to see a return to state-run railways, the majority of people. 
Now, the Labour government has had policy since, or the Labour Party has had policy since 2004 that it will bring the railways back into public ownership. It just didn't do anything during the last government. But increasingly, I think, uh, we will see renationalisation of the railway in the uh, manifesto when we come to 2015. Now, what the, what the Conservative, the, the coalition is trying to do is to frustrate the democratic will of the next two parliaments by saying, well, we'll, we'll let the yep, contracts out now and nobody will be able to touch them. Christian, do you agree with that? Um, well, I, I, I certainly think that it is very strange that all three political parties seem to be stuck on this neoliberal agenda that, you know, you have to uh, have everything out in the private sector and that public sector is bad and, uh, you know, we can't change that. And, uh, you know, we are now at a key moment in, in railway history. It's, it's taken 15 years of the franchise system to get to this point. Uh, but we're at a key moment because not only is this West Coast franchise up, the East Coast franchise is going to be up next year. Uh, nearly all the f whole network is up for renewal between now and, and the time of the next general election. And we're a very interesting moment because I do think they're going to have to look at this system and think, well, what is it for? And they're, they're, they're a bit stuck because... Uh, you know, you can't really imagine a Tory government uh, seeking to renationalise the railways. And yet, if they don't go on with franchising, they would have to do something like that. But John Page was right when he said that most people that most people want the uh, railways to be nationalised. A Guardian poll recently asked whether railways should be nationalised, and it's showing about ninety three percent support. Yes. Oh, well, Do you think uh, that's the only solution to our our woes? Um, yes, it depends what you mean by uh, nationalisation, though, uh, because actually, it is a very strange uh, phenomenon in the world. A lot of it is actually renationalised. The network rail, which, which uh, for your listeners, that runs the uh, track and infrastructure and is separate from the train operators. Network rail is effectively already a, a publicly owned company. It doesn't make profits, or if it makes profits, it, it puts them back in the rail industry. It doesn't have shareholders. So uh, that's effectively renationalised. So the, the one bit that remains to be re renationalised are the train operators. And we've already got one train operator, East Coast, uh, which is temporary in the public sector because uh, the previous incumbent went bust. So uh, what the idea would be, I think the most sensible idea, would be just to say about the rest of the franchises, just let them run out when the private contracts run out and either run them with a not-for-profit uh, company or simply expand the remit of this directly operated railways, which is a, a, a government agency. You could do either of those. So, and I think the public is enormous in favour. I was struck on uh, uh, Question Time, the radio programme, uh, that was, uh, you know, in a, with a relatively pro-Tory audience, because they'd said that before, uh, when somebody suggested renationalising uh, the railways, a union man, Mark Sorotka, <coughs> there was an absolutely loud, spontaneous cheer even before he finished speaking. Absolutely. Neil Clark. Well, we've had three recent polls, haven't we? And they, they've shown 93%, 71%, and 70% in favour. And it tells, it's, it tells you something about the state of democracy in Britain today when we don't have any of our three leading parties actually supporting that policy. And I think that tells us two things. It shows us how out of touch the elite really are on this issue, how out of touch they are with public opinion. And it also shows you the grip that capital has on our political system, big business. But what do you because think, what the, do you banks, think? the banks are the beneficiaries of this. Banks and the big, the big accountancy houses, the big private companies... Sorry, Christian. But, but what, yes, yeah. but what do you think? Uh, you see, I've, I've, I've been struck by this for, 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 for a long time because I've been writing about the railways for, for more than 20 years. And it, it, it just, I still don't quite understand why they've stuck with this system. And I, well, they're I, a time I can warp, see. They're in a 1979 time warp. As you said earlier, you know, public sector bad, private sector good. They're still in this sort of Thatcherite thinking mindset. Um, uh, Uber Thatcherite, really, because Thatcher didn't privatise the railways, as we know. It was John Major. They're still in this sort of 19 set, late 70s mindset, and uh, they've got to break from that because they're out of touch completely. What are the benefits of nationalisation going to be if we do see this? Well, have we out? got two hours? I mean, I could, <laughs> many, many, many. We, we could, uh, by nationalisation, we could get the railways back to running as a public service, as they are in other European countries. We would be able to reduce fares to the European average. Uh, the recent report commissioned by the Transport for Quality of Life. Uh, a quality of transport report uh, said that uh, it would actually save us 1.2 billion a year 
if we bought them back in house uh, we could have an 18 percent cut in ticket prices so we'd have cheaper rail fares more people traveling on the railways we'd have to put we had put more carriages on it'd be a renaissance for the railways it'd be a new golden age of rail engineering industry could come back jobs created it would be wonderful it would get people out of their cars onto the railways it's just what we need so amazing john page we just heard some great figures there what do tssa members want to hear i think tssa members like the vast majority of the traveling public want to see a national integrated rail system under public control i mean just some of those figures i mean christian mentioned the uh, network rail is, is effectively under public control but it's not on the public books and as a consequence of that the excess they have to pay uh, in interest fees on their debt is 156 million pounds just because no government is prepared to admit it is effectively uh, within the public sector that's the sort of money that is being thrown away at a time when this government and indeed the previous government were set to make substantial cuts uh, to public services if you look at the dividends um, something like 400 million pound a year going out in dividends to private sector operators running our railways. That's money that if it was reinvested in the railway under public control will be delivering a higher quality service. And the, the other big issue at the moment of course is that the government's strategy for saving money is not to do the obvious but uh, is to seek to, to take staff off platforms and loads and loads of passengers are horrified uh, either because they think they need somebody in the ticket office to get facts and figures from, someone reliable, someone that they can trust. Or if they're travelling in the evening, they may think, well, I don't want to be on a deserted uh, station. Or if it's somebody who has a disability, they think, well, how on earth am I going to get on the train without support? All of those things this government is prioritising to, to get the staff off, which will have those uh, detrimental effects, when the blind in the obvious solution is to say, well, let's re remove the private sector from the you service. You've been a little bit romantic, though. I mean, I mean about particularly Neil, maybe, that, uh, you know, we, we're not going to get back to British Rail because you can't recreate British Rail. I mean, it, 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 it split, well, you know, it split up. Well, because did it with, you know, they, uh, um, they had a much simpler system. And, and also we've got the rolling stock companies that are passed on. The engineering companies have been broken up. You know, it would be very difficult to, to actually recreate a... a uh, a huge uh, a state organisation like that. So we'd have to think about an, a, a somewhat new structure. And I just wonder, uh, you know, you're saying about bringing back engineering. Well, you know, uh, the, the, there's, a few, hold, hold on, there's sure. a few there's a few, uh, very big engineering companies that make trains. None of them happen to be British-owned anymore. Would we really be able to recreate a, 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 a British industry? There's EU rules. There's a much more complex situation. So, I, I mean, I, I, are you not being slightly romantic there? I don't think so I don't think we should let these sort of ideas you know, stop us from going ahead because I think we're always going to hear people saying it can't be done. New Zealand is a good example. New Zealand was stupid enough to follow the British example and privatise their railways. It was a complete disaster. The Labour government there came in and renationalised. They were told it couldn't be done and it's been a great success. So I think it can be done. We only have to look to Northern Ireland where we have state railways. We only have to look across the, the North Sea to Belgium. You know, it, it's not a major, you know, it's not rocket science, really. We're talking about doing something which most countries in the world have. Isn't We're not talking about something more complex than New Zealand. How is it that, more complex how that than, work in Is it more complex than the French system? France is a big country, the Spanish system. Other European countries can do it, so why can't we? We did it for perfectly well. British Rail ran perfectly well from, from the late 40s to, to, to uh, 1995 six, so it can be done again. So are you saying privatisation is the, is the reason why in Britain we have overcrowded expensive trains whereas we look over to Germany they have well, very efficient and affordable just trains. Just look, look at the stats, look at Northern Ireland, you know, train fares are cheaper there and that's in the UK. Belgium, some fares are 20 times cheaper than, than in the UK and our, uh, our operating costs are up to 40% 40, 40 higher than the rest of Europe. Why are our railways so expensive? It's because of the leakages, the money going out to shareholders, the fat cats, to Richard Branson, etc. That's why our rail railways are so expensive. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London, and I'm Daniel Sinner. Joining me for a discussion on the future of rail franchising is Christian Walmar, one of Britain's leading transport commentators. Neil Clark is a journalist and founder of the Campaign for Public Ownership. And John Page is the Assistant General Secretary of the TSSA Union, which represents people working in transport and travel. These franchises will be coming to an end. Mm. At the end, I mean, effectively, what, we're not sold the railway off. We've leased it out, effectively. When that lease period comes in, the end of the franchise, we say, thank you very much, we'll, ha we'll have back what's ours, 
and, and we'll run it and gradually yeah. as each of those franchises come to an end you gradually recreate a national rail infrastructure if i just pick up on this point of cost though i mean it is absolutely staggering the difference between rail fares in the uk and rail fares across europe so the average fare in the uk for a day return 26 pence per kilometer that's the average you look across somewhere in france it's eight pence a kilometer that's the world of difference that uh, our system is, is costing commuters and of course it's not just costing commuters it's also costing industry because if you don't have an efficient rail system that means that people can afford to get around the country and do business then you, you're actually undermining the, the economic recovery the government seem to think that private companies can run the system better and that nationalized systems will be inefficient and cost a lot of money what would you say to that i'd say look to europe where the vast majority of railways are run uh, as nationalised industries. I think if you look, you know, France, Spain, Netherlands, all, uh, Belgium, all, almost 100% of rail operation is, is in the public Switzerland sector. Switzerland too as well. Uh, Germany is, is over, is probably about 90% uh, and, and so on. And they have lower subsidies, they have lower fares, so where's the efficiency? I, it, it's just a ideological view. I suppose, I suppose one. I mean, one fear, and uh, that uh, the government has, and, and even the Labour Party has, is that uh, is of strikes and strength for the unions. It's not much discussed, but uh, you know, is there not a, a, a problem over the fact that if you did have a large state? Uh, run railway that it would give the unions a lot of strength. We we do have you know quite poor industrial relations on the on the tube where you know there are oft, there is often the threat of strikes. If we look at industrial relations on the national railway uh, from se seventy nine to ninety six, there were only eight strikes. Right? Mm -hmm. Seventeen years, eight strikes. Now, unfortunately, we have a situation now where there must be hundreds of individual pay negotiations taking place each year for different uh, managers and frontline staff, for the track staff and so on, across dozens of train operating companies. And then you've got the network rail strip. That creates more opportunities for points of friction and dispute, which, which do, do happen. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's any evidence that uh, a, a, a unified railway under public control would be any more susceptible to industrial action. In fact, if you look at what's happened with the uh, the uh, train drivers, what you had was a whole system of pay inflation. Uh, I'm not saying that they didn't deserve it, but actually one company would put up wages to attract drivers because none of them were train enough drivers. It's the best thing that ever happened to drivers was privatisation, <laughs> yes. Um, let's bring in Neil Clark from the Campaign for Public Ownership. I agree with John. I think that's just a bogeyman argument, the argument that if we renationalise, then Bob Crow's going to be up there saying everybody out every five minutes is just ludicrous. I mean, you know, it, it, it's not a good reason not to do it because we don't know it's going to happen. It won't happen, probably won't happen. And, and, and uh, as John said, you know, the number of strikes only had eight strikes between, what was it, 79 and 96. So it's a bogus argument, I think. Are there ways to run the railways, especially the main ones, the West Coast and East Coast main lines, the same way that we are running East Coast at the moment since uh, National well, Express got absolutely. shut Absolutely. Richard, I saw Richard Branson was quoting the paper saying that the doomsday scenario would be if the state wants the keys back and, and look at the East Coast line. Well, let's look at the East Coast line. It's improved. Customer satisfaction has improved. There's more carriages, more seats. So that absolutely, I agree 100%. Uh, could we roll that across all 25 current we can, franchises? We can do. I mean, we've got two options. We could renationalise tomorrow if we wanted to, but that would cost a lot of money. Or we can simply do as Christian and John was saying: we can wait till the franchises expire and bring them back in one by one. That would be the cheapest way of doing it. But there are some franchises losing money at the moment. How can the state take them on? Well, I think the state should simply, you know, I mean, it's got to be done case by case. I think there's 10 up, isn't there, in the next two years and 15 before the next election is due. So they're easy just, just to say, look, revert to the state. Other ones we can take on a case by case. We've got to do it, obviously, in the best way that gives the taxpayer no, how, how value for money. How it works is that uh, when you have the contract to run a set of lines, you either pay a premium to run them or you get subsidy. But in effect, they're all subsidised because they also, Network Rail gets a huge big lump sum of three and a half billion pounds paid directly to uh, Network Rail uh, to subsidise the, the track. So effectively, they're all loss making. So they would all, if the counting was done properly, they would all need uh, some sort of subsidy. But that's that's not an issue. I mean, British Rail was, was subsidised. But I do suspect, as, as both my, my colleagues here are saying, that... Uh, it would be a lot cheaper 
uh, to run because there'd be a lot of fewer interfaces. At the moment, we have an army of people who might have to be <laughs> laid off, actually, but we have an army of people who uh, check whose responsibility is for every delay minute. And, you know, there's about 300 of these people. And, you know, it's it's a complete waste of time. They could be redeployed to do useful things like man uh, staff uh, ticket offices or whatever. Uh, uh, absolutely. And I mean, you, t you know, to talk about the madness of the system, every time there is a del delay that is a fault of network rail or judged to be the fault of network rail, they, they pay compensation to the train operating companies. Mm. Millions of pounds paid in compensation. Does any of that money get to the passengers? Very, very little absolutely. indeed. Absolutely. Mm. Mm. Um, so... The government has obviously got to make a decision now between now and the next election on a number of franchises, probably most of them. Um, I just wanted to hear from all of you how you think this story is going to play out. We'll start um, with John. Uh, well, I fear that uh, the government will blinker itself and will try and race to get this franchise out again. I think they'll pay no attention to the facts and the problems. And I think they'll come up st unstuck a second time. Because Do you think it, Richard Branson's going to be happy? You know, it would be very difficult, wouldn't it, to devise a system now which is not influenced by the political circumstances that have led to the refranchising. Neil Clark. Well, I think the Labour Party is the key player in all of this. I mean, I wrote a piece in The New Statesman urging Gordon Brown to reconsider the policy on this issue back before the 2010 election. He didn't take my advice, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and, and Ed Miliband's got a real uh, key moment here for him because he's got an issue where you've got 93, between 70 and 93% of the public on his side. What we want from Labour is a firm commitment. And they would get Tory votes too. And that would leave the government having to look around and think, hey, you know, what, what should we do about this? The problem is, as long as Labour doesn't commit, the Conservatives think, well, Labour's not going to go for it, so we don't go for it either. So what it wants is one of the big three parties to come out. And the likeliest one is Labour. Let's hope the pressure pays off. But the trouble is the sort of Blairites in the Labour Party are still around and they're dead against this. They want to keep to this sort of, sub, uh, you know, Thatcherite agenda. And, and so it's a sort of battle going on within, within the party and that's going to be important. Is this something that we're, we're, that we're likely to see? Well, I mean, Miliband would be crazy if he doesn't go for it. I mean, goodness me, you've got an issue, as I said, when you've got between 70 and 93 percent of the public. The Conservatives are unlikely to go for it. So, so what, what's he waiting for? And finally, to Christian. Well, I think we're in a very interesting moment. I, I think the government are really up against it here. They've got two options, I think. They might uh, create something like a rail agency uh, and devolve a lot of the uh, responsibility from the Department for Transport to a rail agency, like we have a highways agency and all sorts of other agencies. And that would kind of get it a little bit out of the ministerial uh, uh, remit, which would help them. Uh, or they might go the other way and privatise it even more. They might decide that, oh, it's uh, we really need to uh, create uh, some sort of privatised unit run by Price Waterhouse or something <laughs> to uh, help run the railways and uh, let out these franchises and whatever. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time for today's discussion on the future of rail franchising in Britain. Joining me was Christian Walmar, one of Britain's leading transport commentators. Neil Clark is a journalist and founder of the campaign Republic Ownership. And John Page is the Assistant General Secretary of the TSSA Union, which represents people working in transport and travel. But also, one has to wonder, what, why are you passing this risk on to the private sector when nobody knows how many people are going to run the train, or use the trains in uh, three years' time, let alone in 10 or 15 years' time. So it is inevitable that this sort of contract, this weird system, which we call franchising, which is more used to KFC or McDonald's or something, uh, why this weird system of franchising has been uh, used by both the Tories and um, the Labour government and now the coalition government. And Neil Clark from the Campaign for Public Ownership. Hello there. I think the system is absolutely crazy. We, we've got a system whereby uh, the state is subsidising private companies. Uh, we're putting in about... Jim Walmart, one of Britain's leading transport commentators. Um, is the system broken? Uh, well, I think it is. I mean, we have a unique system in the UK of having franchised out our whole railway to private companies 
on the basis that they take the revenue risk. In other words, they collect all the fares income, but that means they have to then guess uh, how much fares income they expect to get over the length of the fr franchise, which uh, have ranged in the past from just uh, three or five years, uh, and now they're trying to let longer franchises, 13 years in the case of the West Coast Mainline. Um, and uh, over the years, various uh, franchise bidders have failed, uh, notably on the East Coast, happened a couple of times. The company had beaten current operator Virgin Trains, owned by Richard Branson, to win the 13-year franchise. But the British Transport Secretary, Patrick McLaughlin, said there were significant technical flaws in the bidding process because of mistakes by his staff at the Department of Transport. The estimated cost of reimbursing four companies for the cost of their bids will be £40 million. Now, Chris Stokes, the former Deputy Director of Franchising at the Department of Transport, says the system is convoluted complicated and inefficient. Nearly 20 years ago, his department sold all 25 franchises, with each bid costing between £250 and £500,000, a process that took just six months. Now the cost is over £5 million, and the whole process takes around a year. So, what is the future of rail franchising? Joining me is Christian Walmar, one of Britain's leading transport commentators. Neil Clark is a journalist and founder of the Campaign for Public Ownership. And John Page is the Assistant General Secretary of the TSSA Union, which represents people working in transport and travel. So I'll begin with you, Christian. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London, and I'm Daniel Sinner, with a discussion on the future of rail franchising in Britain. The way we manage our railways in Britain is fatally flawed. That's according to one of the architects of the privatisation system. In Britain, the train lines are franchised, and sold off to private companies to run for a fixed amount of time. But last week, the decision to award the West Coast Main Line to the company First Group was scrapped by the government. 